All right, welcome to our webinar. It's Establishing Positive, Equitable, and Inclusive um, School Culture. My name is Jane Kofi. I am a curriculum and instructional designer with the Center for Responsive Schools. Um, prior to uh, joining the center full time, I was a classroom teacher. I did two years in a private school. I did pre-K and a one-two combination. And then I taught 18 years in a public school from first grade through fifth grade. So I'm excited to be able to share some content with you around um, rules and how it's connected to supporting students using the responsive classroom approach. Um, before we jump into our content for today, I do wanna take a few moments just to go over three Zoom features that I want everyone to feel comfortable with. For some of you, Zoom is very, very familiar. You may have used it maybe every day or all the time. And for others, it may be a newer platform, but just to make sure that everyone feels comfortable and we're all in the same space when it comes to using these features uh, together today, I just wanna go over a few of them and that way we'll use those and we'll be able to jump into our content for today. So um, on your screen, either located at the top of your screen or located at the bottom of your screen, and for some it's on the side, you will see the um, toolbar for Zoom. For some of you, you might have to click for it to appear, or you might have to hover and it will appear. If you're using a mobile device, it looks a little bit different than it will when you are on, um, say, a laptop, for example. On the toolbar, you'll see that you have the ability to mute and unmute. It's the furthest feature on the left. Um, for most of our time together, you'll be muted, but there will be opportunities where you'll talk to colleagues, and so you'll need to unmute to do that. And you also have opportunities at the end of our time together to ask questions, and so you'll have the opportunity to unmute during that time. The other feature right next to that mute and unmute feature is being able to start and stop camera. So we're able to see your video tile. Um, if you're comfortable, I do invite you to um, allow for us to see and make connections with names and faces. But I also understand if you're at home and there's lots of stuff going on or you're just more comfortable um, having your um, video stopped and not visible, that's fine too. But if you're comfortable, go ahead and allow for other people to match names with faces. And then the final feature that most of you already located was the chat box and that feature is also located on the toolbar. During our time together today, there'll be some opportunities for you to share your ideas or thoughts to questions posed and putting that into the chat box. And there'll also be opportunities where I might ask you to respond using the chat box. Um, you might find that you have questions as we're going out through our time together today. And you may want to put them in the chat box, but also know that as I'm sharing content with you, it might get buried under all of the different comments that come through. So if you want to hold on to your question till the end, you can do that. Or if you want to um, refer to it later, I'll try my best during times when I can to, to like scroll through and make sure I don't miss any questions that people may have posed in the chat box um, during our time. Before we jump into our content, I noticed we have educators from all over. We have some from Minnesota, some from um, Massachusetts. We have quite a few from Virginia, um, just New Jersey, all different places. So to kind of help us um, get a better sense of who we have with us today, I am going to use the Zoom polling feature to find out just a little bit more about um, the people we have together today. It'll help us um, kind of be able to connect more, but then also it'll help me be able to make sure that I'm speaking um, to our group and acknowledging everyone that we have with us today. So for this polling feature, what will happen in just a little bit is um, you will see a question that will appear on your screen. And when it appears on your screen, um, you'll have the option to choose one of several um, responses. What I am going to do is I am going to read the polling question once I have it visible in case for some reason you're not able to see it. That way you're able to still um, have your response included and you can put that into the chat box so that we can get a sense of all the information and who's joining us. So there's two questions I'm going to um, share with us through the poll. And in just a minute, you should be able to see that polling question. I'm going to read it. So in case you're not able to see it, you're able to then respond in the chat box. If you are able to see it, go ahead and respond. And it says, the learning this school year is, for you, is it virtual? Is it in person? Is it a combination of in person and virtual? Or is it not yet decided? And if you find that it's none of the responses that are available to you right now, feel free to use the chat box to put in a response that might be unique to your particular situation. So I'll give us a few more moments to um, respond. Okay, 
Thanks, Carmen. And we're gonna see what it looks like for our group today. So it looks like a majority of our group is um, a combination of in-person and virtual. So that kind of gives us a sense of when we're talking with colleagues that many people will be in the same situation as you are. And then we've got a quite, uh, we've got a fair amount of people that are virtual as well. Um, so that's also helpful. And I know in the chat box, I also saw that um, we've got somebody who's in person. So that's also helpful to know. So as I'm sharing information with you, I wanna also be able to keep that in mind. So I'm addressing the different situations and environments for learning um, that we have with us today. I'm gonna to share one more question with you through the poll. And um, this question is just about the roles. We have many people were able to share that um, in the chat box so that we're able to see it kind of in a different way. I'm gonna share this question with you too. And so this question is about um, your role in your building. So maybe you're an elementary educator, maybe you're a middle school educator, school leader, a specialist resource teacher, or um, if none of those is listed, you can also mark others. I'll give you a moment to do that. And you can also use the chat box if, you, um, if you're more comfortable doing that or if you're not able to see the poll. All right, so I'm gonna take a look at our results. So we have a sense of who's here with us and that way as we're connecting with colleagues, we have the opportunity to find out you know what we have in common as educators, but then also noticing that we have quite a few people who are in special areas as well as elementary educators and um, some people who are in different unique roles in their buildings as well. So um, some that are after school um, and they support children after school and then um, special education and supporting students who receive um, special education services. So that's really helpful to know as we jump into our content today. So with that being said, I'm gonna share with us what our goal for our time together is. And so I'm gonna look at the, the learning goals for our time. So take a moment and read those over to yourself. So really our hope today is really to think about how rules are going to support students in being successful and how we can set that up so that it creates a positive, equitable, and inclusive environment for students to learn, especially in this unique setting that everyone is experiencing this school year. The way that we're going to um, get to these goals is through this agenda. So this is what we're gonna cover throughout our time together today. So I'll give you a moment to quickly look that over. The way that um, this webinar is structured, it'll give you the opportunity to do some independent reflection. And for some people that is just thinking on your own um, silently. For others, it's jotting some ideas down. You'll also have the opportunity to talk to other colleagues who had our time together today. And then also the opportunity to share using the chat box and then ask questions towards the end of our time. So it gives you a little bit of an idea of how our time together is structured so you know that you'll have the opportunity to connect with colleagues at different points during our webinar today. So before we jump in, I just wanna acknowledge and honor the fact that um, you all are navigating a very unique situation this year. So everyone is experiencing something different that um, last school year did not look like. So whether in looking at our results, many people are doing this virtually or doing a combination of virtual and in-person. And so the idea behind all of this is that we really wanna think about how we can be mindful in creating that learning environment that allows students to feel um, heard, to feel um, known and to feel included. So to help us to jump into our thinking for today, I am gonna to pose a question for you. I'm gonna give you a moment to think about that independently. So the question I want you to think about is what makes an environment positive, equitable, and inclusive for students? So take a moment and think about that question to yourself. And if you're someone who it helped you to jot things down, go ahead and do that. And if for you, you just need a moment or two to think to yourself, do that. And take a moment and think about this question. We are gonna take um, a moment afterwards to, to share out some of those and I'll tell you how we'll do that. So take a moment and think about this question. I'm already noticing people sharing ideas about how to make the environment safe and comfortable for students so they can be successful, but then also recognizing what we have to do as educators in terms of being just flexible and um, more understanding so that students can feel that sense of safety. I've seen quite a bit already about 
being able to build community by establishing relationships and strengthening those relationships and making sure we know all of our students and our students know one another. It already sounds like people are really thinking about what needs to be in place so that students can feel that sense of belonging and feel included. So already from the responses that people have shared, this is going to really help us get into thinking about what needs to happen so that students do feel included, so that students do feel like the environment is equitable for them, but it's also a positive environment for students. To do that, I'm going to first help us kind of get grounded in thinking about um, the responsive classroom approach and the core belief to that. This is the core belief of the responsive classroom approach. I am going to give you a moment to read over it, and I'm just going to chat about or um, kind of touch upon a few things. To take a moment and read that core belief to yourself. The core belief of the responsive classroom approach um, states that in order for optimal learning to occur, students have to have a set of skills or competencies in order to be successful in school, but also outside of school. So there are social emotional competencies like cooperation, self-control, responsibility, empathy, um, and assertiveness, as well as academic competencies that students need to also have the opportunity to learn. So academic mindsets and perseverance, learning strategies, and academic behaviors. These skills need to be taught to students and so that students are given the opportunity not only to learn these skills, but practice them, reinforce them, and strengthen them in order to be successful in school as well as outside of school. We want to keep this in mind as we're thinking through the content today because as we think about some of the things that people posted in terms of being flexible or creating an environment where students feel heard and known, there are some pieces and some of these competencies that come into play that students need to be taught in order for them to be successful. So with that in mind and thinking about the core belief, we want to connect it to how with the core belief and the idea of the responsive classroom approach, how that creates an environment for students to feel included and to feel safe and to be heard. So regardless of how students enter into the environment, so whether it's virtual or it's a combination of virtual and in person or something a little bit different, that a responsive classroom teacher creates a setting that allows for every child to be successful, regardless of their background. They're able to access that, that learning or that knowledge or that setting because it's set up in a way in which the approach embraces a diverse, equitable, and inclusive environment through the practices and the strategies that are used. So when thinking about those practices and strategies that are used to support students, we wanna think about with this core belief in mind, and thinking about the focus is establishing learning communities that are positive, that are equitable, that are inclusive. We want to consider what helps an environment be this way for students to create that school culture that helps students feel successful, to feel safe, and to feel included. So I'm going to have us think about a question so that we can kind of think about it a little bit from our students' perspective, but being able to make that connection as well. So I want you to imagine that you're in an environment that is unfamiliar to you or that's new to you. So it can be the school environment if you're like, this is the first time that I'm having to teach virtually or this is the first time we're going to have to teach a blended model. That might be the new environment for you or it can be something a little bit more personal. So for example, I, I remember getting invited to a Friendsgiving and I've never been to one. And that was very new for me. So I wasn't sure how it worked. I figured it kind of worked like Thanksgiving, but maybe with a little bit of a twist, but it was one of those situations that was new for me and the environment was new for me. So we act and we feel different when things are unfamiliar or new. So here's the question I want you to think about. If you've got that idea in your mind of, okay, hey, here's this particular environment, it's new or it's unfamiliar. So how do you feel in an environment like that? So maybe for you in an environment that's new or that's unfamiliar, perhaps for you, you might say to yourself, okay, I'm a little bit more reserved or I feel really nervous, or maybe you're really excited in an environment that's new or unfamiliar for you. I want you to also think about how you might behave in an environment like that. When I was in that environment for this Friendsgiving, it was new for me and I was actually very nervous and I felt myself being very reserved. I was less likely to mingle with people. I didn't talk very much. This environment made me feel a little bit uncomfortable. Even though the person who invited me, I knew it was still new and it was still unfamiliar for me. So I want you to take a moment to think about that situation for you. It can be 
the school situation for you now, that might be something that's new and unfamiliar. Or it can be something that's a little bit more personal. You can even think about it like if you're thinking about maybe a child or a student that you have, or maybe your own children when they're in a new or unfamiliar environment. It can even be a pet when a pet's in a new and unfamiliar environment. What does that feel like and how, how do you behave in that environment? So I'm gonna give you a moment to collect your thoughts and think about that. You're going to get the chance and the opportunity to chat with others about what it's like when you're in an, an unfamiliar new environment. How do you behave? What do you say? What do you do? What does that feel like for you? If it's helpful for you to jot down a few thoughts, go ahead and do that. And if for you, it's just thinking through what you might say, take a moment to think about that too. In just a minute, I'm going to um, put you in a smaller, um, in a pairing, and we're gonna use the Zoom breakout rooms to do that. And the way that will work is you'll get invited to a breakout room. For some of you, it will, you will automatically end up in a room or still on the same Zoom platform, but just with one other person. And for others of you, you'll get an invitation that asks you to join that room. And then all you need to do is accept that invitation so that you're speaking with another person. You'll have three minutes, up to three minutes to talk, and then you'll get 30 seconds to wrap up your thought about that. And as you are chatting, take a moment first before you begin to just introduce yourself so that you can connect with that person first, know that person's name before you share um, something that's new and unfamiliar and how that might feel. It might just be like, when I'm in a breakout room, it's new and unfamiliar for me, and this is how I feel, and here's how I talk or speak. Hopefully you had a moment to share with another um, person about that unfamiliar or that new situation and what that feels like and just even how you behave when you're in a space like that. And so I had the opportunity to talk with another person about what that might feel like. And one of the things that she shared is that she can sometimes be really hopeful um, for possibilities that are new and what that might be like. And maybe for some of you, you can connect in that way too. Maybe when you're in a new or unfamiliar space, you're also hopeful. You're excited about the opportunities or the possibilities that are um, yet to come or what might be coming up. And I had shared that I was, um, was a little bit more reserved and quiet. And I like to just observe and process when I'm in an unfamiliar and new environment, just to kind of see what is the norm and what is everyone doing. So as we think about these environments that are, that are new and that are unfamiliar, we want to take a moment to think about and connect that to what the school year is like for, for educators, for students, for families, for everyone this year. And that if we want to foster a, a learning environment that's um, positive for students and that students are able to be successful and we need to think about um, starting first with how do we create that environment where students feel safe because this is new and, un and unfamiliar for students and families and educators and even if in the spring you jumped into a virtual world right away it doesn't mean that um, it's something that everyone has really quite um, come into a space where they feel really comfortable with it all of a sudden. So let's think about now those our current teaching and current school reality. In our group, we already know that we have quite a few people who are teaching in a virtual environment with students, and we've got quite a few that are doing blended, and I believe one person was in person. And so as we think about that, virtual, just even the virtual environment can look several different ways. You can have it be live and synchronous for parts of it, and it can also be asynchronous for parts of it. So even that is new and unfamiliar. So perhaps students did live um, before, but may not have been with you. And it may not have been with that same group of students. So this is still new and unfamiliar for some students. And then that blended environment, and that can take on many different forms. So maybe the blended environment for some is you've got students who are in person with you while others are live on, on screen and seeing what's happening live in the classroom while you've got students who are with you. Maybe your blended environment is one where students come on certain days of the week, you have half of your class, and then on another day you have a different half, and then maybe everyone's virtual on different days or different parts of the day. And then for the social distance or socially distanced environment, that can also look different and new and unfamiliar for students because most likely last year they weren't experiencing settings where they had to be six feet away from their teachers or where their teachers were having to wear masks or where it kind of felt like they were in their own little cubicles for learning. 
So all of this is new and unfamiliar. So if we think about new and unfamiliar for us as adults and how we respond, and all those responses are new and valid and different, let's think about what that might feel like for students. We're really thinking about how do we create an environment that's positive and that's inclusive for students. We wanna really start with how is it feeling for them? So how might students be feeling in these learning environments? How might they behave? I want you to take a moment and you can just jot them down if you're someone who likes to jot down things or if you just wanna take a moment to think to yourself about this question. How might students be feeling in these learning environments that are virtual or blended or socially distanced? And how might they behave? So just as before, you'll find yourself in the breakout room with the same person that you were just chatting with. There's a couple of places where it might look a little bit different as we had people enter. And so if you end up in a, a breakout room and there's someone new there, as before, make sure you introduce yourself um, before you jump into sharing about how it might feel for students and how they might behave in an environment that's new and unfamiliar for them. You'll have three minutes and then 30 seconds to wrap up your thought before we rejoin and we can be back in the larger group. You're gonna head out to your breakout rooms now. Welcome back everyone. Hopefully you had an opportunity to share with another um, colleague about what it might feel like for students. And so that we can all get a sense of some of the ideas shared, I'm gonna invite you to use the chat box and you can either um, put in the chat box what your partner shared or what you shared about what it might feel like for students to be in any of these environments because these environments are new and unfamiliar for them. Or you can put into the chat box how students might behave when things are new and unfamiliar for them. So take a moment, locate the chat box feature on your Zoom toolbar, and then use that to quickly put in some of those ideas of some things that you shared about how students might feel or how they might behave in an environment that's new and unfamiliar. It seems to me that many people are really thinking about either what you're experiencing now and how students are feeling and how that might feel for them. And then also just maybe even connecting to how it might feel for you when you're in a space similar to what is new and unfamiliar for students, whether it's virtual, whether it's a combination of both or whether it's in person. So as we think about these feelings, we wanna connect that to, if we want this school year that is very new and very unique to be a school year in which students are successful and they're feeling success, we wanna create um, expectations that allow students to be successful. And we wanna do that by first considering the climate that we wanna create for students so that they can be successful in this new and unfamiliar space in which we wanna see them be successful. So there are a few things that we want to keep in mind first in order to create this environment for students and so that that climate or that stage or that foundation is set so that students can then be successful. So these three things about building and strengthening relationships, establishing practices and routines, but then also generating goals. So when we think about building and strengthening relationships. That's what people had mentioned at the very beginning when they were thinking about, well, what are some ways we could create equitable, positive, and inclusive environments? Many people had stated that it was really important to strengthen and build relationships, that students are in a space for some where they are, it's just them behind a computer and everyone's on the other side of this virtual world. And for others, it's in person, but they can't be really close to one another. And so it can create these feelings of isolation. And so even more so, um, really considering ways about how we build relationships. Some things that we can do is being able to use things or practices such as morning meeting or responsive advisory meeting for middle school in ways that allow for us to set the tone for the day and also for the year where students get the opportunity to greet one another, to share with one another and make connections, to have fun with one another, but then also to use that to, to jump into the learning for the day. And when we're thinking about creating those relationships, being really aware that it's, it's something that we're gonna to have to work harder at because it's not the same way as it was before. And as people had posted in the chat box, those feelings of loneliness and isolation, we wanna be able to be mindful of that so that we're constantly thinking of ways that we can include all students. That brings us to our idea of establishing and practicing and learning routines and procedures. All the routines and procedures of this year are going to be unique and new and different. They're going to be ones that um, 
we always use, but there might be some adjustments to them because the environment is different. This learning environment is unfamiliar. And so we want students to feel successful. And that means in order for them to be successful, we want to take the time to teach these different skills that students need in order for them to be successful. We might use practices such as interactive modeling that allow students to see and do the noticing of those particular routines and those procedures and those skills. And also knowing that because we've shown them and we've taught it to them once, this is new. And so giving them multiple opportunities to practice these skills is important. So maybe you show them, so when we are speaking and we've got people who are joining us virtually and we've got people in person, we want to use this kind of voice. We may have to remind students of that every single time they have an opportunity to talk. Or when students join you online, you may need to remind them every single time that we have the chat box for this reason during this time and reminding them what it sounds like and looks like when they're in a virtual environment. And knowing that it's new and it's different and it's not the way that they've done school before. So we may have to remind multiple times. And then once we've had a chance to start to build and strengthen those relationships and make sure that students know what those expectations are with regard to our routines and our procedures and the skills that they need. And if you think back to those skills that we talked about at the start, those, those competencies, we want to make sure that we're, we're teaching those so that students can be successful with those. That leads us into having students really think about what do they want to be able to accomplish this year? What do they want to be successful with this year? And them being able to have the opportunity to set goals. And so with elementary, we, we, we call those their hopes and dreams. And in middle school, those are their SMART goals that they're setting up so that they have the opportunity to set those goals for themselves. And being able to see those um, kind of come to fruition as the year moves on. And once they accomplish a goal, being able to set another goal. And so in order for students to be able to do this and do this successfully, we've set this climate and we've talked about this and we've thought through how do we make it so that students feel comfortable and we're creating an environment where students are able to do that. We've strengthened those relationships and we've made sure that here are the goals that students have for the year. We want to create this equitable classroom environment. Um, and the way that we do that is by co-creating the rules so that students also have say and they're thinking through how these rules might look and sound for them in this new and unfamiliar environment. So in responsive classroom, there are certain characteristics that we use in a process that we use to help students um, be a part of the rule creation process. And in the rule creation process, it allows for students and for educators to proactively think about the ways that students um, can be successful and the ways that we help them accomplish their goals and their hopes and dreams for the year. And so we're thinking about um, how it can be positive that the rules that we set up for students are um, done in a proactive way. And that basically means that you're describing the positive expectations for students. So you're letting them know what they can do and what they should do. So in our classroom environment, we will be maybe respectful and thinking about how to frame those rules in a way that um, is developmentally appropriate. So for example, you may consider using other words for some of your younger learners. So maybe respectful is really abstract for students. You might think, so in our classroom, we're going to be kind. And that helps them to start to get to the understanding of what respectful might look like and sound like for them. It also means framing it at the ideal, describing those positive expectations that you hope to see students accomplish and that they're, they're general guidelines. That means they can apply in all areas. So they're not so finite that students need multiple rules to be able to meet expectations, but they meet all areas. So for example, it might say something like, um, uh, we, are, we take care of our virtual learning community so that students know that, okay, so if we're taking care of our virtual learning community, it looks like this, it sounds like this, and we act like this, and it feels like this, when we're taking care of our virtual learning community. The rules that we come up with with students need to be ones that we allow for discussion and, and just thinking for students to think through. So if we're in this virtual learning community and we've got some students who are joining us um, in person, what might be helpful to know and what might be helpful to do so that everyone can be seen and heard and allowing students to speak into that and hearing their ideas 
And if someone says something or a student says something that you may not quite understand or may not work for your classroom community, asking them a little bit more about it. So tell me more about this particular thing that you think is going to work for our classroom community. And you might find that, oh, I hadn't considered it like this or I hadn't thought about it this way. This is something that we can consider or we might try as the year goes on. We might see how this works for our class and if it's not working, we're gonna come back to it. And then the final piece when we think about it is that it requires action. And so that basically means it's not just here are our, our norms or our, our rules or our guidelines and you state them for students, but as you start new things. So we're about to start our math block. Which of our rules is really gonna support us in doing our best thinking today? So students can see how they're connected to their learning and how what they came up with and how you co-created them work in all parts of their day. So maybe you're jumping into a break for a moment. So we're about to take a break and one of our rules is that we're respecting our classroom community. And so if we're doing that, what is that going to look like? What are we going to have to do so we're all back in our spaces on time for the next learning block? Or we're all ready for this next piece of learning so that students can feel successful in this way. Also know that when we establish these expectations with students, when we, when we co-create them with students, it allows them to have ownership. It allows them to see their role and their piece in creating their classroom community so that it feels like it's part of something that they had a say in as well. If you're in an environment where, say, for example, your school already has rules, maybe you have um, uh, school-wide rules for your entire school, thinking about taking those school-wide rules and then connecting them to that learning environment. So our rules for our school is that we're respectful, we're safe, and we're strong learners. Maybe those are your rules for your school. And if those are the rules for your school, then you're thinking about, so if our school rules say we're respectful, we're safe, how are we respectful right now when we log in to the computer? How are we respectful when we use the chat box? How are we respectful when we're talking to someone else in the classroom so that other people can be heard? So allowing for that to connect to what they're doing and what's happening in each part of their day. So students know the rules and it becomes a living, breathing, um, like a living, breathing document in the space that you're, you're learning in. So whether they're posted and you put them on a screen where students see them all the time, or whether they're posted in the classroom where children see them all the time, you wanna make sure that students know them because they were a part of creating them and that you're constantly referring to them so that students can, can access them and see how they work in the rest of their day. So I want you to think about this question with what I've just shared with you. Consider your current classroom environment. So whether that's virtual or it's um, like a blended model of virtual and in person, what characteristics of the collaborative rulemaking process might you need to consider in order to support a positive school culture? So perhaps, for example, for you, you have rules that you put in place with your students, but maybe students don't really have a say in them. Or maybe you didn't really get to court, um, co, um, um, create them in a way where students had a voice in the rules. How can you then come back to the rules and think about, so here are the expectations that I set out for us. How do you think these look or how might they feel for us? What do they look like in our classroom community? So they have a chance to connect to them in that way. Or maybe you haven't really thought about um, how they require action. And that's something you wanna consider. I'm going to go back to the previous slides. You can see some of those pieces and those characteristics so you can think about what might you want to consider. So maybe they're very, very specific and you're thinking about I need to make them a little bit more general so they apply to all areas of learning. I'll give you a few moments to think about that. And I'll give you next steps with what we're going to do with your thinking. You're going to have the opportunity in just a moment to think about um, this question that I posed earlier and to think through it with a colleague. So you're gonna to speak to the same person that you were just with, and maybe you hadn't really thought about how to make them um, um, proactive, and maybe you hadn't really thought about allowing for opportunities for students to speak into the rules. Or maybe you, may, maybe you hadn't thought about referring to the rules and having students think about them at different blocks of time during your school day. And so taking a moment to chat with another colleague and you may gain some ideas and things that you hadn't considered and then being able to share those ideas too with others. So just as before, you're going to be in that same space with that same person. 
If you find there's someone new in your space just as before, make sure you introduce yourself to one another before you start chatting. Welcome back everyone. Hopefully you had the opportunity to chat a little bit and just to learn from one another and gain some insight and some thoughts. Before um, we come to the space where you have the opportunity to ask questions, there are a few things that I want you to keep in mind when you think about where your students are in the year. Some of you have been working with your students and in that learning environment for maybe a month now, maybe you started in August. And for others of you, you may have started maybe this week or last week. And so it's just new and students are just getting into the groove of what this new and unfamiliar looks like. And as you're thinking about the rules and just this environment with students and things to keep in mind as you're trying to adapt them for what it looks like, whether it's virtual or it's it's a blended model or they're in person is is that this is new and if you think about what people posted in the chat box about um, it being frustrating sometimes or isolating or lonely um, and even exciting for students you're going to get all of those all in one and i want to share with you something that i noticed and it made me also think about that when it comes to whether you call them guidelines or you call them rules or you call them norms um, for your students but just thinking about how they're established. And I had the opportunity to listen in on a class that was learning and the teacher every day goes over the norms. And these are our norms for our class or our norms for math. And um, uh, it seemed that the students were having a hard time remembering some of the directions that were being given to them. And so the teacher asked, you know, what is it that's making it difficult um, for us to be able to get all these directions and she asked is it that I'm not being clear or is there too much too much information that's coming um, and a child raised their hand and this was a virtual community and said it's too much information and the teacher then proceeded to say well I've, I've done it this way for you I've done it this way for you and she had so many ways for students to access directions for assignments and then the child then said it's a lot and that was a lot for that child and, 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 and these children are in fifth grade, but it was a lot. And then the teacher proceeded to say, well, I don't know how else I can help you because I've already showed you all the different ways and our rules say we're active listeners. And as I listened to that and I thought about that, though the teacher did do a really strong job of connecting it to the rules, the piece is this is new and unfamiliar. And it's very new for students. So even though you may say, well, you need to be an active listener, it still means we need to go back and make things clear for students. And as um, in this particular platform that the students use, they can say how they're feeling throughout the lesson. And this child then posted an, a, a sad face because now she, she, she felt like she could not access what happened. And as I thought about that, it made me think more about how when we, we establish rules, it doesn't mean that they're there and everyone is gonna follow them all the time. We don't even do that as adults. We don't follow the rules all the time. And so if we know that children who've only been you know alive for maybe seven, five, four years, they only have that much knowledge under their belts. Whereas us as adults, we've had so many more years to be able to um, navigate different situations and challenges. They're still learning that. So if we connect back to what we talked about with the core belief and those competencies, we have to teach them that. So even though the rule might say we're active listeners, what does that look like when a lot of information is coming to you and you have to figure out how to navigate all of that and still pay attention and, and remember the first thing that was said and then also the last thing that was said so that you can be successful. If we want students to be able to access the environment and access learning and for it to feel like an environment where they belong, we want to be mindful of not only that if this is the rule that we're setting, it might mean we have to have a little bit of, and I saw this in the chat box, flexibility with how we're, we're sharing things with students. So this is the rule and also that part about discussion, if a rule is not working for your classroom community, you do need to change it and you need to consider what you need to do differently so that students can be successful. So if you've got a rule and, and you're like, this is our rule and it's not working, if it's being active listeners and you realize like, students don't really understand what it looks like and sounds like to be an active listener, you may need to think about and reconsider that rule. And you may need to think about, oh, how do I teach that? I may have to break it down a little bit differently for my students. So even if they're sixth graders, um, probably right now, they're still like, kind of like fifth graders. And even if they're second graders, kind of like right now, they're probably like first graders. And so we might need to consider that and also on top of 
and it's a new environment and this is not the way they learned and if you have those younger learners like kindergartners they probably imagine school to look very different than what it looks like right now and so keeping that in mind because you might get a lot of excited children because it's school and you might get a lot of nervous children because the school doesn't feel like what they thought and so whether they are five or whether they are 12, we wanna keep that in mind as we're thinking about the rules that we establish with students. So in thinking about what I've shared with you today, I want you to kind of solidify and think about um, the content that I just shared. And I want you to focus on this question. So with all that I've shared with you, what is one idea that you wanna consider about the rule creation process with your students in this current school reality? So take a moment and think as you're bringing your thoughts to a close, I want to share with you how you'll um, share out this response or your response to this question. You'll get to meet with that same colleague in just a little bit. And again, if there's someone new, just make sure you introduce yourself and sharing out just something that you're, you're thinking about that you want to consider as you think about the rule creation process um, with your students this year, especially with this unique school setting that everyone is experiencing. So you'll have two minutes to share and then we'll gather back together. So you had the opportunity to just kind of really think about this question and just something that you want to hold on to and consider with the rule creation process. I want to share with you as we come to a close um, some resources that are helpful to consult as you're thinking about rules with students. And so just a few. If you don't know these ones already, the first six weeks of school and building academic community. Um, the academic communities one is for middle school. And I noticed in our group, we didn't have any middle school educators, but if it's something that you're interested in, I did want to point it out. As well as the first six weeks of school, some of you are very familiar with this resource and have used it in the past, but using it to think through the process and how it's laid out, depending on whether you have kindergarten or whether you have fourth grade and how it's rolled out and in the way that it's done so that you start with building community and then thinking about rules and procedures and then considering those goals for students. And so it helps you kind of, if you're like, I'm not sure how or how much time I might need to think about the rule creation process and how it will start, gives you a place, a good starting place with that. Another resource or two resources, one elementary and one middle, is teaching self-discipline and seeing the good in students. Very similarly, starting with the idea of how we build community, going all the way through the point of, or through thinking about rules, but also things like practices like role play or thinking about interactive modeling and um, how you might use those with students and how you might have to adapt them, thinking about the way things look now for students. And then finally, some other resources are these quick coaching guides. There are many, um, there are 20 different ones, but these are just three of them. Um, you're welcome to visit the website to see all of them. But if you're someone who's very um, familiar with the responsive classroom approach, or you've been dabbling in it a little bit, maybe these quick coaching guides might be something that um, kind of uh, a resource that might be one that you might wanna consult if you're thinking about a specific area. So if you're thinking about, I wanna create an environment that's welcoming for my students, you might refer to this one particular quick coaching guide. So it allows you to kind of get a quick, um, a quick snapshot of some of those pieces that help support students being successful and just support your entire classroom community. So those are options as well. And as always, you're welcome to email me um, you can email me at jane at responsiveclassroom.org, or you can visit the website at www.responsiveclassroom.org to find other resources as well as articles and printables that you can refer to um, to help you kind of continue this very unique journey that everyone is on right now. And what I want to do now, if you are someone where um, you have questions that you want to ask, this is an opportunity to be able to do that. If you feel like this is a good stopping place for you, feel free to depart at this time. I just want to thank you for joining um, today and joining this webinar. So if this is a good place for you to depart, feel free to do that. And if you would like to hang on and um, ask questions or just listen to responses to questions, you're welcome to do that too. Um, and as always, thank you for joining us today. I'm gonna make it so we can see everyone if you have a question that you wanna share. If you're familiar with the Zoom platform, you're welcome to go to the participants um, feature. There is an opportunity to raise hand there. 
and I can answer your question that way, or you can use your physical hand and raise it that way too. Um, for those of you who are departing, thank you, and um, hopefully you have a great rest of your school year. I see hands, so I'm gonna get to those. Um, Heather, if you'll unmute yourself and share. Sure, I am teaching third grade remotely this year, okay. and I've been struggling a little bit with the collaborative nature of the rule creation process. And I don't know if you had any tips up your sleeve to share. Um, I, had, I got the opportunity to work with um, some students over the summer teaching a summer institute. So I, I got to navigate some of the, the intricacies of doing things virtually um, and some things that go really well and some that don't. One of the things I found um, I thought it would be great to use things like the, the Zoom whiteboard and everyone added to that. Um, it didn't work for me and I, I learned from that and I learned that perhaps I needed to use a different one. Um, the other thing that I found that I watched a teacher do was um, allowed for every child to have a Google slide and they put their thoughts into the slide and everyone could see everyone's and she could see everyone's and that allowed for them to think that way and then also go through the process of what do you notice that's the same on everyone's? What are some unique ones on everyone's slide? Um, I, had I thought that, would have done that because that was probably a better way to go about it than what I did, but um, you learn and then you modify. And so that's something that I would suggest um, that, I, that I thought was a really helpful way for students to all have a voice and all have an, uh, an opportunity to kind of share what they were thinking. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Anna, if you'll unmute. So my, um, my role is a bit different. I'm not in a classroom. I work in staff development at the, the division level. And we're really trying to be intentional in our planning for professional learning around teacher needs right now. And mm -hmm. with our current learning situation, we've all, we started all virtual and okay. we're getting ready to kind of phase back in some kids to face to face. And division-wide, um, we utilize PDIS. And so mm -hmm. with the schools that are implementing responsive classroom practices with fidelity, many of them use their morning meeting as an opportunity to co-create the rules around their, mm -hmm. um, their school-wide expectations. And so I've seen firsthand my own two elementary school students, which you might hear in the background, <laughs> um, have done some co-creation around their matrices with their teachers for the virtual situation. So what would you say to teachers as they're thinking about transitioning their kids back into face-to-face? -face? What, what, what are some considerations they need to have in mind as they're, they're shifting those expectations back to a face-to-face? -face? I think it's a great opportunity to revisit those rules and open it up for discussion. There may be some rules that they see that it works for their in-person um, environment and that they're able to then say, you know, we have this rule about respect, say it's something like respect our online community. Well, we're not online anymore. So let's think about this rule and revisiting this rule. How might we adjust this rule now that we're in person? What might it look like and sound like um, now that we're not in a virtual community, we're in person. So students may come up with you know, respect our in-person community, or they might come up with something completely different that still speaks to the same, um, the same point of what that rule was supposed to, to meet and how it's supposed to support students. But it definitely allows for an opportunity for another discussion. It gives them, just like um, we would if we get to another point in the year, like I found myself after the holidays, coming back after winter break and coming back to the rules because now I have, I have older fourth graders than I did when I started the year and looking back at the rules and saying, do these rules still work for our, our fourth grade community now that we're like halfway through our fourth grade year? So it allows for that discussion now that we are in person, do these rules still work for our in-person community? Which, where are some places that we can make adjustments? What are some things that we might need that are different now that we're in person? What are some things that we may not need um, because we're in person? and having students think through that, but then also knowing that you may have to come back and revisit them. So say on a Monday, you, you have this discussion and you established um, some rules for your in-person community. And by Friday, you're noticing some of these are not working. It, it gives you the opportunity to come back. So even saying, so we're gonna live with these rules for this week or 
for these next two weeks and we're going to come back and revisit them and see if these rules still work for our in-person community. So it allows for more discussion for that for students as well. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I want to make sure I didn't miss any for real hands if there were some. Okay. If you find that you have a question, especially if you're like, this is just about me and I just want to ask this question and maybe it's later on in the year or maybe it's just tomorrow, feel free to email me. I am happy um, to receive emails and I will respond as soon as possible, um, usually within 24 hours. So feel free to email or you can always check the website as well. Gina, I see your real hand. <laughs> well, I was thinking, um... I didn't have anything and then something came to me if it's okay, but no, absolutely. Is there, is there one thing you've noticed would be a difference between co-creating rules and doing hopes and dreams in the classroom and virtually? Like, is there one suggestion you would have or, or one thing you've noticed as you've worked with schools and classrooms and the work That's that you've done different. recently? There's some yeah. few things that I noticed that are a little bit different and I'm not quite sure to na how to navigate some of those. So for example, in person, what we've typically done is those hopes and dreams are posted and we see all the time everywhere, like when we're in the classroom and that's a little bit harder in a virtual community to have those up and seen all the time. Um, so then the question or something to consider is how do you make those still alive for students throughout the year so that they just don't become something we did at the beginning of the year and we never came back to them. Um, so whether that is, it's in your, your Google stream, like, hey, here are the highlights of the week. Whose goals might we meet, we be touching this week? Go back and look at our hopes and goals chart so that somehow students are still revisiting them um, because without that, it kind of, it, it, it doesn't hold the same power as it does when you were in person and you still want it, you still want it to. So it's or could you maybe consolidate them some way and then when you talk about one rule, say, you know, 30% mm -hmm. of our class um, had this hope and dream so when you talk, like, because we always refer to the hopes and dreams and the rules yes. together. So there, yeah, there's, that's something definitely to think about. Okay, thank you. I think you. that's a great idea. Especially if you're like, if it's everyone wants to become a stronger reader and 30% of your class right. wants to do that, then referring to the, those goals and say, so 30% of our class is really focusing on reading. So as we jump into right. this, at least you're, you're yeah. constantly referring to it. Something, some way to constantly refer to them. Yeah. Yes. Or if one of your backgrounds was a picture of them. And no, that was a that way to really come back. Good. Yeah. Sorry, I don't mean to make this a brain. No. Thing. Everyone else is that's, like, okay. <laughs> No, I think yeah. that's really So helpful. you said you had a couple. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yes. And, and with that piece, um, the other thing uh, to consider is if, if you are working from school-wide rules and there are rules that um, have been in place in your school for a while, that um, you, the time is taken to make them new. And what I mean when I say about that is that it doesn't become like rote, like they say it and they just know it. And it's, our rules are be responsible, be respectful, be a friend. And, and it, they just know it and they say it, but it doesn't apply. So it, it kind of means bringing them to life in a different way. Um, so it might mean when you jump into to working in pairs, for example, if, you, if you're doing it virtually or if you're doing it six, six feet away, it looks different when you're being respectful because it sounds louder when you're six feet away and it doesn't sound, may not sound respectful, but the idea is like, so our voices sound louder and we're still being respectful by the word choices that we're making. Like, can you say that a little bit softer? Can you repeat that a little bit louder? I didn't quite hear that. So then you're teaching that skill of how they can be assertive in that way so that it's still respectful, but it matches the current situation. So if you do have those rules that um, have been around and students know them because um, they're, they're just like here, I listen to my child recite hers and I'm like, do, do you actually know what it looks like? She's like, no, we just say this. And, and she does know, but she's so used to just saying them that she hasn't quite applied them to what it looks like in math and what it looks like in social studies and what it looks like in PE so that it actually looks like she's doing those things in those different blocks of time. So just making sure that they are, they're alive um, and still feel new, even if it's, Things like if you've been at the school for the same like five years and they know them, making sure they're new for, for this situation so they can apply them that way. 
which is actually kind of cool because it gives us an opportunity to make sure they're being critical thinkers about them. Yes, absolutely. So what does that mean when we're virtual? And what does that mean when you're six feet from the person next to you or when there are, per there are students joining us or classmates joining us on a screen and you're in person? How does that look and what does that, what is, what that look like, what will that feel like so that they can consider that in a new environment? These are all really helpful questions because they help me think too. Other questions? Feel free. Laurie, I see your hand. Yeah, I, I'm trying to debate whether to email you or just to say it, but I'll just ask. Either way. Other people here, but I'm going from working with fourth and fifth graders in person and really I'm more of a collaborative person to working with a group of kids virtually. Um, it's an after school mm -hmm. program. I call it an after school program on steroids because they <laughs> it's so well developed and so amazing. Um, but I'm working with a couple of, I probably have a couple of second graders, a first grader, uh, and maybe one fourth grader. Uh, they're, they're younger kids. And I'm really nervous about the language. Um, mm -hmm. Because I, I really am fourth and fifth grade, they're real thinkers and they're just, you know, they're not, I, I mostly want them to, to not leave the room. <laughs> so I'm trying to think of ways to frame it. We're going to be setting, I'm opening the whole thing on Monday. Mm, okay. In stack, which is a great, actually, it's, we're trying to keep it as similar to the in-person as possible. So we're going to actually have a very casual conversation and emphasize how similar the virtual is to the in-person. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll probably be over snack, which is perfectly fine. But I'm struggling with some of the language. If anyone has any good language for that age group um, in terms of questions, I would really appreciate it. You have a, a, a span from first to fourth when you yeah. when done that. And I have done um, multi-age several times. So it, it is, it is um, one of those things to consider when you have um, a span of ages in one room. One of the first things that came to mind is, and I, I'm, you probably already thought of this, is first thinking about how to establish the relationship so that they are actually going to be taking care of their first grader and the second grader and the fourth grader because they're all in different grade levels. So things like, what do you notice about our group? What are some things our group has in common? And um, being able to create a community where they are starting to take care of one another and they started to relate to one another and they're starting to make connections. Um, like the activity, um, 10 things in common, I don't know if you know it, but where it's just, so let's see if we can figure out 10 things we have in common. Since you're doing it over snack, it's, um, it's more of a relaxed environment yeah. to, them to do that. Um, so that they're first building those relationships because that's going to be important. It's going to be really hard for them to establish any expectations if they don't feel like they, they don't feel like they're a community first. Okay. Um, so I would start there and then being able to open up the discussion. I've done K1 and pre-K and, and they have a lot to say. Um, so I, you'd probably be surprised or be um, pleasantly surprised in how they'll be able to work off of one another. Oh, to good. To share um, those ideas. And then also how some of your older students may... Um, may be willing to help um, some of your younger learners um, articulate some of the ideas that they're thinking. And so that will be helpful. And then you'll probably start to notice what your group needs and being able to navigate how to support them in discussion, as well as you're getting to know them as a group as well. And so you'll probably realize, okay, when I, when I say this, this is helpful. And so I'm going to use this phrasing or use this terminology when I'm speaking to them. And I think that'll come as you're you're building that relationship and that community um, amongst that group of learners. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Gives yeah. me a way to start. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I do not want to make people feel like they have to stay on. Feel free to if you have a question. And if not, you're like, this is a good stopping place for me. Feel free um, to end the call too. I just want to thank you for hanging on and just being willing to ask questions and listen to responses too.